and to you, shalom from Jerusalem, wherever you may be. Several questions and comments in the chat of the last two weeks correctly asked, what about X or Y, the Yuda family in Moza, Rabbi Eliel Mani in Hebron, as well as noting developments in the Sephardic communities in 16th century Tiberius and Sfat. And I agree. However, within the limits of a 45-minute lecture, I had to cut much out in the interest of time, and not all could be covered. Some topics were discussed briefly later, or will be covered tonight, or perhaps next time, or perhaps in other lectures. Please continue to type your questions and comments into the chat, and we will, and we will get to some of them tonight, and they will help direct me for my final lecture next week. In this four-point part series on the Jews from the Middle East and North Africa in late Ottoman Palestine, I will focus tonight on women in the Yeshuv, the Jewish communities of pre-state Palestine, going back to topics uh, raised in the first lecture, their love of Zion and attachment to the Holy Land, motivation for Aliyah, and the actual process of leaving and traveling, reflecting this evening on gendered aspects of these topics, as well as those in discussed in the second lecture on where they settled and how they lived. Definitions, definitions of space and place are simultaneously physical and social constructs, and as such, are intricately weaven, woven together. Space and place are both objective and subjective, exposed and protected, definite and indefinite, um, sacred and, and secular, private and public. Uh, Michel Foucault calls this heterogeneous space and states, quote, we live inside a set of relations that delineate sites. That is to say, the location of sites may well depend on the interaction between, between others. Complicating this idea further, neither space nor place, neither geographic location nor social identity is static nor do they have clear, fixed boundaries. They are constantly being formed and reformed in traditional society as well as modern times. As I tried to show last week in mapping the ethnic identities of Jews in the urban communities, space and social relations are so intricately in linked that the two concepts should be considered as complementary and not mutually exclusive. Judith Tucker, an historian of the Middle East and gender noted that these active forces at times meshed and at times opposed each other. And her comments are particularly relevant to the discussion on Jewish women in 19th century Palestine. Quote, women, because of their sex, were subject to discrimination and constraints. At the same time, they, were, they protected and prefer, preserved many of the customs and forms of family relations that seemed to them to serve their interests and battled those that threatened their position. Kathy Friedman Kaseba, in her discussion of Jewish and Italian women in New York at the turn of the 20th century, contends that migrating and settling and resettling allowed women to imagine, define, and identify themselves somehow apart and different from that which others defined them. This may indicate a sense of empowerment that reflects an expansion in the content and meaning of social categories. As such, women are, in Friedman Kaseba's words, reflecting those of Tucker, quote, active negotiators in the cultural values that they choose to accept and cultural entrepreneurs who are actively engaging with their cultural frameworks and continuously transforming them. These ideas of negotiating space and place, identity and community, will accompany the journey of women from North Africa and the Middle East to 19th and early 20th century Eretz Israel. My aim is to attempt to answer questions such as, what can women's space within different residential areas Tell us about the social norms of traditional communities in 19th century Eretz Israel, and more significantly, to what extent 
could the women in these communities control and, in, and influence their space? As a case study, I will examine the particular situation of women and widows in the North African Jewish community of late Ottoman Jerusalem, but not, limit to them, not limited to them alone, and will relate to women in other communities as well. I chose traditional North African Jewish women in Jerusalem as a, an extreme case, as they were members of a community marginalized, even within the Sephardic community of the city, although, as I pointed out last week, not in other towns and cities. They were extremely poverty-stricken and far from the centers of power and influence. Thus, this study affords a unique window into the lives of Jewish women. What is cultural capital and how can it expand the boundaries of traditional life? Cultural capital is a term used to denote the social assets of a person, which can be used as resources and social action, as compared to economic capital. Cultural capital encompasses a socialized tendency to act, to think, or feel in a particular way. Such resources can be invested and accumulated and can be converted into other forms, as can economic resources. For our discussion here, we will see how traditional Jewish women's cultural capital, that is, socially accepted norms, beliefs, and actions, can promote aliyah and other forms of social and geographic mobility, confirm social status, and influence power structures. Beginning with Saint Generation, to which I made reference in the past two lectures. During the 19th century, particularly in Morocco and Algeria, informal, charismatic social forces grew markedly at the expense of formal and institutionalized elements. And alternative form modes of religious behavior arose outside normative practice of Judaism. Popular mystical customs developed customs which were not always sanctioned by the rabbis and often at variance with the normative Jewish legal code. Practices such as pilgrimages to visit saintly men and women, living and dead, to make supplications for their divine intervention transferred Kabbalistic customs associated with the Holy Land to sites in North Africa and reinforced popular belief in supernatural powers. The graves of those Shadarim, rabbinical emissaries from the Holy Land, who died while traveling in North Africa, were endowed with an additional aura of sanctity, and in fact became new religious sites, attracting the devoted. These pilgrimages within the Maghreb thus created hundreds of sacred sites, conceived to be similar but inferior to those in the Holy Land. Many were perceived to have a close geographic proximity to the Holy Land, irrespective of, of actual physical space. Pious men living and dead were purported to have traveled from their homes or graves directly to Jerusalem's father Tiberius in a matter of hours. Women, as well as men, and perhaps more than men, participated in Hilulot, public celebrations of the venerated departed souls and belief in the special powers of saintly men and women. Women's participation in local pilgrimages to grave sites of the, these saints became increasingly popular in the mid-19th century and continued in the 20th century under colon, French colonial rule. In his work on saint veneration and its psychological influences, Yoram Bilou notes that, quote, generally the presence of saints was a given in the social reality of Moroccan Jews, a certain, a central idiom for articulating a wide range of experiences, unquote, as well as strongly felt in daily routine, as people would cry out his name and dream about him whenever facing a problem. Rabbinic literature and ethnographic studies document women initiating such pilgrimages, as well as their participation in the annual Hilulot celebrations on the anniversaries of the death of the tzaddikim. In late 19th century Morocco, Rabbi Chaim, uh, Chaim Massas of Meknes even ruled that a husband is obligated to take his wife to visit the graves of the righteous or allow her to go, or allow her to go 
although rabbis in the cities of Fez and Safo often had reservations. For 19th century women in the Maghreb, as those studying in early modern Spain or 17th century Tzfat, religious devotion most certainly provided an opportunity for self-expression in, in a society that rarely allowed women's voices to be heard. Significantly, Alexandra Kufel, in her study of Tzfat, notes similarly to Judith Tucker and uh, Kathy Friedman Koseba, whom I quoted at the beginning of my talk, quote, Jewish women seem to have actively adapted and benefited these new customs, that is, visiting the graves of so, slight saintly men, to construct a new kind of spiritual authority for themselves. Although local pilgrimages are beyond this, the scope of this talk, they are crucial to understanding the understanding of traditional Jewish women's geographic mobility, sacred space, and aliyah. Visits to the sites of the revered tzaddikim or righteous emphasize each individual's personal participation in the process of re redemption regardless of gender, a, a concept intricately associated with the Holy Land. Pilgrimages to and Hilulo celebrations at the grave sites thus reinforce North African Jewish women's traditional love of Zion and personal link with the land as well as strengthening forms of religious expression outside the established rituals of institutions of the community. Both pilgrimages as well as both pilgrimages as temporary or seasonal migrations and aliyah, a form of permanent migration, are manifestations of religious or spiritual aspirations. In light of the important links between North African saints and Eretz Israel, both reflect a deep physical as well as emotional connection with the Holy Land. Once these practices became accepted forms of behavior and technology provided ever-improving forms of transportation, Aliyah seems to have become a realistic as well as emotional extension of the pilgrimages, empowering women both geographically and spiritually. Locales identified with holy rabbis as, as those in Sfat and Tiberias became choice destination, destinations in Eretz Yisrael. For 19th century uh, uh, women, Aliyah and a changed lifestyle in the Holy Land presented possibilities for self-expression, but not, and I must uh, emphasize, for social revolution. They strove to rework their positions within tradition. Many women vowed to thank God for fulfilling a prayer, for fulfilling a prayer, and to pray at graves or reputed graves of famous rabbis, as a second century Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in Meron near Tzfat, Rabbi Meir Balanes near Tiberias, or the grave of the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel. The vows of women were much more private and informal than those of men, and thus were not documented in written communal records. However, they are remembered and relayed in stories transmitted by family members through the generations. Upon their arrival in the Holy Land, women prayed fervently and frequently at the graves of saintly rabbis, making supplications for their own personal benefit as well as for Jews in general. Thus, for women as well as men, traveling from the grave sites in Morocco to those in Eretz Israel was an almost a natural extension of their beliefs. These non-formal and non-institutional expressions of religiosity have revealed women's spirituality and their use of sacred space, otherwise unrecognized or marginalized. A deep emotional attachment to the Holy Land and the belief in its inherent spiritual qualities which living in the country endows upon its Jewish inhabitants as atonement for sins, answers to private individual prayers, health and longevity have no gender bias. Those living in the land also became emissaries for their respective families and communities as well for the Jewish people as a whole. In fulfilling commandments of living in the land, 
This mission not only added special status and sanctity to those living in Zion, but also had monetary benefits. To participate in the life in the land, Jews living outside the land sent contributions to the holy cities to sustain their communities in the, their continually dis, distressed circumstances. In this way, the funds collected abroad and distributed to the poor were not simply charity, but also tokens of, their particip of this participation. Certain aspects of the traditional love for Zion seem to have been defined specifically by gender. While men could and did express their attachment to the Holy Land, as well as elevate their status through study, prayer, and communal activities, all the while living in their home communities, women seeking to express their love of Zion and spiritual uplifting had no direct part in these, such, in these activities. Family obligations, daily concerns, and social restrictions on mobility were obstacles for women in fulfilling these aspirations. Women often had to make do with local pilgrimages, unless their husbands also endeavored to make Aliyah. Now focusing on women and Aliyah. Aliyah offered women active, functional ways to express their spirituality and fulfill their aspirations for higher levels of personal sanctity. While in their home communities, most avenues, as noted, for increased in the, in the synagogues and study halls were barred to them. However, the sanctity of living in the Holy Land afforded women access to the sacred, even if not always equal access. Some women sought to enhance the sanctity of their lives. Others hoped to fulfill personal vows to visit to the graves of pious, vows made usually together with prayers and supplication for aid in times of stress. Aliyah became possible for a great number of women only through associational migration, that is, with their nuclear or extended families, accompanied by their fathers, husbands, or sons. One of the dominant characteristics of Aliyah in the 19th century, as Jewish migration in general, is its pattern of family migration. Family cohesion and continuity supported the immigrants during their journey and adjustments to their new environment after their arrival. Rabbinical court decisions presenting instances of family discord indicate that the decision to migrate to Eretz Yisrael was a family decision and women were active participants and their wishes were usually honored. In the 1858 judicial court case brought before Rabbi Raphael Moshe Elbaz in Sefru, Morocco, for example, affirmed the right of women to immigrate to Eretz Yisrael. However, a significant number of wi widows also immigrated to Eretz Yisrael. It seems that women, more than men, chose to spend their final years in the Holy Land, and this applied particularly to widows. Many win widows traveled to the Holy Land together with their extended families, with their married children, brothers, or uncles. In 1844, for example, eight families set out from the Moroccan city of Meknes on their way to Eretz Yisrael, most accompanied by widowed mothers. In 1854, quote, 10 elderly widows and another of great skill in sewing and also learned in the Bible, unquote, set out from Meknes independent of their own families, but traveling together with a group of families from the, from the same town. An 1855 list of widows in the Sephardic community of Tzvan, which we will look at shortly, enumerates some 16 widows, all in their 50s and 60s, all of whom migrated from the same, in the same year from the same Tunisian community of Jerba. The same census enumerates only five married men arriving from Jerba at the time, leading to the conclusion that most, if not all, the women arrived as, as widows. Widowhood is also turning marginality to, uh, to opportunity. 19th century census list reveals that twice as many men, women as men emigrated over the age of 60. Although nearly all the males were married or remarried at the time of their arrival, this was not necessarily the case for women. Due to the high mortality rates in Palestine and the Maghreb, um, 
Uh, it is difficult and the limitations of uh, documentation, it is difficult to ascertain who among the women arrived as widows and who were widowed long after their arrival as girls or young married women. One notation on the 1855 census of Maghrebi Jews in Jerusalem, of Maghrebi widows in Jerusalem, notes that all the widows came with their husbands. However, much to our distress, they died. In spite of the fact that statistical information available is on, uh, statistical information is available only for those women enumerated as widows at the time of the census, the difference is still significant. Widowhood, while tragic and traumatic, also presents new opportunities for women. These women, who had been integrally involved in community activity via their families and held a measure of status via their husbands, were often marginalized and almost immediately upon the death of a spouse. Though they may have enhanced status as matriarchs, they were likely to become a burden upon their families or communities, both financially and socially. Social conventions generally limited the geographic mobility for women in traditional societies, although economic need, family obligation, and philanthropic activities often mitigated such prohibitions. Widowhood was effectively a passport to freedom, an idea elaborated on by Ruth Lamden in her study of 16th century Jewish women in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Women who had previously been under the jurisdiction of their fathers, brothers, and husbands became legal entities in their own right, able to make their own decisions and manage their own affairs, at least theoretically. However, this was often only perceived independence as economic necessity and social limitations often curtailed, curtailed their actual activities. With the range with, with the change in personal status from married to widow, almost overnight these women were pushed to the sidelines of their communities and even ostracized from them. Whether rich or poor, they were required to examine their lives and reevaluate re their future. Widows were in a unique posi position and their passport gave them greater flexibility. Their religious traditions served as cultural resources for their empowerment and allowed them to stretch the limits of women's spatial mobility, whether in visiting the sick, pilgrimages to grave sites, or even aliyah. Should they so decide, these widows could finally fulfill their desires and dreams and migrate to Eretz Israel, sanctioned by both family and community. However, it must be emphasized that such autonomy and perceived independence was limited by their own economic resources or those made available to them by their families. Using gender as a variable in the study of migration has also suggested that certain categories of women are in fact selected out for migration or actually pushed out. Among those are women already at the fringes of society who were single and especially widows. Although older widows were the matriarchs of their family and as such assumed an elevated status, this status must be distinguished from their often marginalized functions in daily life, creating a potential conflict with the younger generation. Jewish families may have recognized this distinction and thus accepted and even encouraged the decision of their mothers and sisters to migrate to Eretz Yisrael, often assisting them financially. Their marginality and relative autonomy meshed together and encouraged their aliyah. Geographic mobility for traditional women, not only allowed by rabbinical authorities and social attitudes, but officially sanctioned as a good deed and even encouraged, although not only for spiritual reasons alone is noted. Thus, their cultural capital afforded them the opportunity to travel. The combination of these two major ruptured by migration and family status due to the death of the spouse present unique circumstances for studying women in traditional society and their reformulations of social relationships and social constraints on space 
in place. The changing landscape of late Ottoman Palestine, which is ever, ever increasing and diversifying uh, Jewish population due to migration, high mortality rates and its perceived spiritual qualities created propitious opportunities for defining, reimagining, and relocating physical and social identities, particularly for women and most significantly for widows, often without extended families in the city. A major problem in historical research on women is finding them. During the 19th century, the adult Jewish population was not evenly divided between males and females. The overwhelming majority was female. One reason for this is to be found in patterns of aliyah for families and widows as shown. A combination of differential mortality rates, both in the Maghreb and Palestine, with more men dying earlier and marriage patterns with the brides often much younger than the grooms created a demographic imbalance, which in turn created more potential for women to remain widows, for women to remain widows, even at a relatively young age. This also related, re resulted in a greater statistical possibility for widowed or divorced men to remarry than for women in the community. Although polygon Polygamy did exist, its occurrence was relatively uncommon in 19th century, both for North Africa and in Palestine. As in much research on gender, sources are particularly challenging. It was the men who wrote the records, letters, documents, and other historical sources available to us today. And women are barely visible. Although they were in their homes and courtyards and in the marketplace, Praying at, at holy sites. Occasionally, descriptions of women in Palestine can be found in travelers' journals and, and diplomatic papers. Alternative sources and methodologies have provided rich and promising evidence of women's lives. Much can be culled, for example, from oral documentation collected from elderly female informants, descendants of those women immigrants opening a window onto the lives of the grandmothers. A wealth of demographic information can be culled from censuses carried out by Sir Moses Montefiore five times in the Jewish communities of 19th century Palestine, as discussed last week. In most instances, the Jewish population was enumerated by household, with detailed information related only to the male head of the household. Approximately a quarter of all North African immigrants, for example, arrived as children under the age of 15. Well over half of the men enumerated were in the prime of their lives, between 20 and 50, and less than a fifth were over the age of 50. In spite of the richness of the Montefiore census lists, the lists of B'nai Yisrael, the households headed by males, are fraught with problems for gender research, and here we can see the name of the male, where he came from, the, his age, how long he was in Israel, but only the name of the wife. We have no information on them on age or place of origin. Sometimes the women, the married women are anonymous and not even noted in the census. And we have to figure that they existed through the total number in the family, for example, the name of a male, no information on the wife, but two members in the family. Um, uh, so we also have some information in the observations noted. For example, he is ill and his wife is very ill. The numerous widows in each of the communities were, were enumerated on separate detailed lists. Although we cannot con reconstruct the comprehensive picture relating to all women, it does provide reliable information for studying them. A statistical analysis of all census shows that women constituted a clear majority of the adult Jewish population. Approximately two-thirds of adult, Jewish, adult Jews were women. This significant majority, nearly two women for every one male, was due to the overwhelming number of widows, both Ashkenazi from 
European countries, Svardi, primarily from the Ottoman Empire, and from North Africa. And we can see here some of this detailed information. We have the name and the name of their, uh, their deceased husband. We have the, name, the place of their birth, their age, sometimes here in um, Hebrew letters for the numerical value, and the time they arrived, how many years ago. Other list shows us the name in numbers and the year of their migration, again in, in, um, in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew year. Um, by calculation, we can therefore figure out their age at um, Aliyah. And in this, this um, uh, chart, we can see that the majority actually were 40 and under. So they definitely, in my opinion, were not coming to die in the Holy Land, but to, uh, to, but to empower themselves. Um, some widows listed together, were listed together with those of their, with those of their uh, married sons and daughters. We have the, the widows on the widows list. We also, many of them came, were listed with children. Some of them not old. So here how we have the number of children, their names and ages, as on the list for B'nai Yisrael, also how many over and under the age of 13 bar mitzvah. Um, we have various lists, have various information. Sometimes we have their ages, sometimes we don't. Um, uh, the large number of women, and especially widows in Jewish communities of Palestine, created new realities and new demands. As most of them were poor and without family support, many relied on, on weekly communal aid for their most basic needs. Prior to their aliyah, most of these same women had contributed to the emissaries who collected funds for the Jewish communities in the holy cities. Although they did not intend to make use of these monies themselves, when they fell on hard times after arriving in the country, they did expect to receive some support. So we can see here on the list that all these, peop all these widows had nothing, velo klum, and although some work here, we have ones that um, received money from all these, received money from the um, community um, coffers. However, with the growing num with the and he however, with the growing numbers of needy and increased expenses and communal responsibilities, the coffers were continually empty. The meager allotments that the widows received, even smaller than those offered to the men of the community, could not cover the minimal expenses of basic housing, food, and clothing. Although North, in North Africa and the Middle East, women did work for pay, such work was often done in their own homes or in the homes of others, and as such, little was recorded. In the cities of Palestine, their work was more visible, as well as greater necessity. Social conventions could no longer limit women's activities since basic survival depended upon their employment. In Tiberias and in Sfat, married women and widows sewed clothing, laundered, sold eggs and other foodstuffs and more. In Jerusalem, and here we have, we see that we have um, those that were, all these have to do with, uh, with um, cleaning the, the grains, which I will short relate to. One did nothing. The um, others, two others worked in the, in the English hospital. In Jerusalem, Maghrebi women were conspicuous in the community for their work grinding wheat and sifting flour, as bread entailed much work on a constant basis. Needless to say, in times of drought or economic crisis, these women were left without any means of income. And quote, because of the great poverty and cost, it is not even enough to cover their needs and they are left lacking. Here we can see some of the work involved that um, here, just for the purpose of illustration, I found a picture of men doing the initial sorting and cleaning of the grain. Then it must be sorted, it must be ground. Um, sewing also was another occupation, both of them, as we could see, done either inside the home or and outside in courtyards, and often together. Um, another fascinating uh, um, source 
is a collection of short vignettes on women collected in the 1920s and written by Pinchas Grayevsky, a colorful individual and member of the old yeshiv in, yeshuv in Jerusalem, which I will discuss next week. He has, a, in addition to many other works, he has a series of 10 pamphlets, which were uh, republished in, 2000 in, um, in the year 2000 in one uh, volume. And these he had short um, parts on various women. Sarah, renowned for her hospitality. Malka, Rivka, the laundress. And here we have many of the simple women, or so-called simple women, who contributed to themselves and to society. Nonetheless, there were hundreds who received allocations. And here we have a booklet of yearly accounts. Some received on a daily basis, some on a weekly basis, or some just before holidays, or Kimcha de Pascha, before, Pes before Passover. An ambivalent attitude towards widows, a discrepancy between the offsung expressions and esteem of a woman of valor, as noted in Proverbs 31, and the inferior status of women in daily practice. The women received significantly lower allocations than men. There were, however, women with some means who tried to alleviate the situation, both individually, as Delicia ben Shimon Kois, the daughter of Rabbi Shimon David ben Shimon, head of the North African Jews Committee and wife of a member of the Hungarian Kola, and therefore another example of intermarriage, and in organized aid societies. Some women even had the means to dedicate rooms for communal use. During World War I, the situation was even more dire, with no possibilities for work. Women and children had to rely solely on financial and material assistance primarily food. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, died of starvation. Back to those living, living on the fringes and living in the center. After the decision to migrate, the painful separation from family and community, and the hardships of travel, women's faced new problems in the Holy Land. Jewish women had the opportunity the challenge, and in, indeed the necessity of redefining them space, themselves in space and place, particularly in dealing with the economic pressures, particularly in dealing with economic pressures. And widows were often alone in the, fam in the city without family. Housing was a primary issue for new immigrants and old timers alike. As the Jewish population in all the cities of Palestine increased, additional living space was, was continually required. Existing housing in small rooms surrounded by inner courtyards became overcrowded and conditions continually deteriorated. Although rooms were added in the open areas of courtyards and on roofs, the demand, the demand for housing outstripped the supply. Most of the Jews rented their meager apartments for Muslims and the, law, the market laws of supply and demand caused the annual rents to soar. A small number of widows lived together with their married sons or daughters. Many crowded together in rented rooms and courtyards, primarily or exclusively inhabited by, by uh, widows. The 1875 list for Sephardic Jews in Jerusalem is unique and that is organized by courtyards, including men, their families and dependents, as well as widows and their dependents, and not alphabetically or by synagogue affiliation of the men as the other census lists. For example, in three courtyards of this unique census, we see here noted as number 126, 127, and 128, um, um, uh, these listings open the opportunity for geographic analysis, although with limitations. In the Parnas courtyard, numbered 126 here, the mother of Avram Irmama, the sister and the sister of Avram Mano, reside with their families. The red indicates women. A red line uh, the red lines indicate anonymous women. We can, we can figure out by the total number in the courtyard. Courtyard 127 indicates 
includes eight married couples, three of them with children, and three widows, two of them with children. However, 15 widows reside in courtyard number 128, but only five married couples, one of them with an extended family of three generations. Even within the total confine, in the very close confines of the Jewish courtyards, these everyday spaces reflect potential separation, which, as noted, are infinitely woven together with gender identities and social strategies. And we could see again from this list the small family size, which I um, noted last week and several commented on in the chat. While the great majority of the Jewish population in Palestine in general were poor and lived in crowded conditions, the plight of widows and orphans was particularly distressing. They barely survived in rented accommodations, even with assistance from the communal funds. An urgent need for housing for this specific group in the population constituted a challenge for the leadership of each of the communities. In response to the desperate and growing need, private as well as communal projects were initiated to ease the housing crisis. The negotiation of space, identity, and social relationships, and the fluid boundaries of Jewish territory reflect the continuing reformulations of space and place in traditional society. An ambivalent attitude towards widows a discrepancy between the commandment to care for the widows and orphans and the pressures of communal priorities and empty coffers are apparent in the variations of housing arrangements for these women. Shelters, specifically for widows, were established. Here, for example, number seven on the map, on the uh, uh, top right-hand side, some were in rented rooms funded by local or diaspora Jews. Others were in rooms or buildings endowed to the various communities and religious trust, a hekdesh or a waqf. Maghrebi Jews in Jerusalem created a seemingly unique solution to the widow's housing crisis. Within each of the community synagogue courtyards, or annexed to the synagogues, were rooms spe specified for poor widows. The Tzuftvash synagogue complex founded in 1860 and still in use in the Jewish quarter today, for example, originally included at least one room for poor widows, here number four in red, who in turn cared for the maintenance of the synagogue, cleaning, lighting, oil, lamps, and the physical needs of those using it, such as preparing tea for those studying. Although one interpretation may see this as patronizing and denigrating, a reading more in line with the social strategies of traditional women suggests this arrangement may reflect the protected status of women as opposed to subjected or dominated status. And that women uh, actually sought out um, uh, uh, these rooms as they themselves struggled to retain aspects that benefited them. Such living arrangements and daily tasks also gave women greater accessibility to the holy via direct contact with the synagogue and indirectly through those studying and praying. This solution seems to be unique to the North African Jews and to Jerusalem. However, even those endowed rooms could not keep up with the increasing needs of the community. The more innovative began to look in look in the surrounding area outside the city walls. Communal housing for the poor was constructed on land available in the new Jewish neighborhoods as Jerusalem's Maghrebi Machane Yisrael neighborhood, established in 1868. A synagogue was established there with ground floor, room, ground floor rooms set aside for poor widows and orphans. The male communal leaders publicly acknowledged uh, their traditional responsibility and obligations for the poor, the widow, and the orphans, as well as their inability to deal with the problem at hand, and described the desperate situation in an appeal for, for donations. We have but one courtyard uh, with an almshouse for the poor. This is in the Machane Yisrael neighborhood. But it is insufficient for even a third or a quarter of the needy, and in each of the six 
in each room six and seven widows living together in great poverty. Others are abandoned on Jerusalem's streets as we have no money for more houses. Economic circumstances, more than anything else, seem to have dictated the location of housing for the poor. On the one hand, public housing was located in the cheapest areas and those farthest from the communal centers. On the other hand, housing poor, for poor widows was also located in central areas and buildings dedicated to the communities, usually after the owner's death. In the North African community of, Jeru of Jerusalem, um, housing was even located at the very center of communal activity, adjacent to its synagogues, both within the city walls and outside of them. Again, it seems that a basic cause for this was economic. In the synagogue courtyard or building, space was already controlled by the community. However, one must also acknowledge the priority given to community in this community's out, given to the priority given to widows in this community's allocation of space. Turning to one last example very briefly of marginality, which can become an opportunity, that of education. Men were commanded to teach their sons Torah. As they had to work, classes were organized for the children, often by synagogues or the community, to study Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, as well as prayers. In contrast, girls and women were traditionally exempt from study and marginalized from it, and only learned at home those laws and customs necessarily for their daily lives. The flip side of this marginalization from education, and thus from positions of leadership and communal power, was that they were permitted go to go to the new schools established in Palestine by European Jewish philanthropic organizations, as the French Alliance Israelite Universelle, um, uh, in which the gate of the school still stands today on Jaffa Street uh, next to the Klal building, and the Anglo, uh, and then the British Anglo Jewish Association, which founded the Evelina de Rothschild School for Girls, directed by the legendary Miss Annie. Schools were established in all the towns and cities, attracting Sephardi, North African, and Middle Eastern Jews particularly those schools teaching a profession, generally sewing. In conclusion, the changing landscape of late Ottoman Jerusalem, with its ever-increasing increasing and diversifying Jewish population due to migration, as well as its perceived spiritual qualities as the Holy Land, created propitious opportunities for redefinition, reimagination, and relocating physical and, local and social identities, particularly for women and most significantly for the many widows among those making Aliyah. How then did these North African women seemingly negotiate space and identity and become cultural entrepreneurs and active negotiators of the cultural values that they chose to accept? Although some of this is based on circumstantial evidence, it does seem that their re relative independence and freedom enabled many of them to carry out their dreams, um, fulfill their vows and express their own religious aspirations, and to fulfill their dreams and vow and to fulfill their dreams. They visited holy sites and graves, poured out their personal prayers and supplications, and used their physical service to the community scholars and its synagogues to achieve their spiritual goals. Aliyah from North Africa, and specifically the, the large number of women, both married and widowed, not only added to the social weave of the communities, but in fact changed it. The very fact of their emigration and presence in the Holy Land proclaimed their right to achieve their self-defined goals, while at the same time, time reworking tradition to accommodate them as independent women, even if economic necessity dictated dependence on communal funds. It seems that the same love of Zion and desire to attain a higher level of personal sanctity, which motivated these women to emigrate, continued to fortify them after their arrival in the Holy Land and gave them strength to cope 
with the harsh poverty and enormous problems of daily life in 19th century Palestine. These women protected and preserved many of the customs which seemed to them to serve their interests and resisted those that re threatened their position. These processes allowed women, and especially widows, a certain degree of empowerment within their new society. The negotiation of space, then, was a critical component in the shifting boundaries of social norms and in the reformulation of identity for women in 19th century Palestine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michal. Always interesting to see these familiar places from Jerusalem and see how they're part of history. Um, we have a few questions in our chat. If anyone else has, this is also time to add. Um, Vivian wants to know if there is documentation of women married or widowed uh, outside of Jerusalem. Um, yes, we have a limited amount of information. Um, all the communal lists of um, communal funds being allocated have uh, lists and lists of widows. But we have no demographic information. We have no idea where they came from. We have no idea um, when they came. We have no idea of their age. And we can only sort of figure out whether they had children as dependents or not because it's often in the amount of money that they received. So if you see a woman with twice or three times the amount of money, the assumption <clears throat> is that she had children. So that the fact of the widow's list, I could have used, in terms of demographic information, I could have used um, the widow's list in the Montefiore census for its Fat or Tiberius as well. The uniqueness of the 1875 census in Jerusalem is that it also gave us a division by courtyards, which is not found in any other census list. So therefore, I chose Jerusalem. Okay. Um, Carol wants to know, what is the main reason that so many women were willing to leave North Africa for Palestine? Um, for a variety of reasons, primarily in order to fulfill their dreams of coming to the Holy Land, whether to fulfill vows, to, to pray on the graves of uh, ho the holy men, or to um, attain another level of spirituality. I also spoke of how some of them wanted to leave a problematic family situation. You know, there, there were all various uh, reasons. It certainly was not economic because they barely found work in, I mean, they weren't women migrating for labor um, reasons as we have women migrants in the 19th and 20th and 21st century because there's very little work here. But there were all kinds of it. Sometimes they came because their friends, their other widows who were their friends were coming. And although their friends may have had good reasons, they just wanted to come to be along with their friends. They just wanted to accompany their friends. Okay, in this answer, you managed to answer a few other questions along with it. Um, uh, what is the term to denote North African Jews? If I understand, Sephardim are from Turkey. Um, I spoke about that, perhaps it wasn't quite right. clear here, but I spoke about it extensively in the past two lectures. We have again the problem of terminology. Who are we talking about? Where the Sephardim, if we're using the term more um, uh, uh, limited, are those that who originally left Spain after the Inquisition in the late 1500s, in the late 15th century, after the expulsion in 1492. They, they went to primarily in the Mediterranean, primarily to the Balkans and Turkey. Some went to North Africa. So North Africa, we have a combination of Svartic Jews as well as the indigenous North African Jews. When we go further east of the Mediterranean, very few Svartic Jews came there, and we have the indigenous Jews that were living in today's Iraq, Iran, etc. So we have a combination of terms, Svartic, meaning those primarily coming from the Ottoman Balkans and Turkey, 
North African Jews, which may or may not include the Spanish exiles, and Middle Eastern Jews from farther east. So that was what I meant, whether in the, until the 1880s, most of the community under the aegis of the Sephardic Jewish communities were either from North Africa or the Balkans and Turkey. Only from the 1880s on did you have waves of immigration from Yemen, from Iraq, from, um, and from today's Iran, Kurdistan, okay, just, Bukhara, other sorry. places. Um, just before we end, do you, could you maybe give, say a few words about next week's session, which is basically the last one in the series? Sure. Um, next session, and it will be a concluding lecture, and I will relate to the um, participation of, again, using the terminology Sephardic, North African, and Middle Eastern Jews in the Zionist Yeshuv and its implication for Zionist historiography. And we've had many questions in the chat, how come we never knew? Or were they Zionists or not? So this is not only um, a description of the situation as I understand it with their participation, it's also an emphasis on what happened for the historical narratives after World War I, say, or even before World War I. You know, how did, this, how did the Zionist and Jewish narratives marginalize the story? And what does that mean for today? How are we reclaiming this part of the narrative and integrating it into the overall picture. I will also try to uh, set aside time or devote time to any of your questions. So please do send to Tamar or Kathy, whoever, whatever email you have in the chat there, your questions so I, can, I will um, hopefully be able to, to um, spend time on some of the topics that perhaps you may have particular interest in. And I will pass on to you whatever's in the chat. I apologize for those whose questions didn't get answered. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope you. you join us for our next session next week. Thank you very much, Michal. Thank you, Kathy, Adam, and Udi. Okay, thank you all.